killing the journalist won't kill the story. That's the simple and powerful message behind the organization Forbidden Stories, a network of journalists whose mission is to pursue and publish the work of other reporters who have been murdered, imprisoned, or threatened. As we mark the International Day to end impunity for crimes against journalists, the founder of Forbidden Stories, Laurent Richard, joins us in the studio. Uh, Laurent, thank you so much for being here. Hello. Forbidden Stories has only been around for five years. You launched it back in 2017. Can you start by telling us how the idea came about? Yeah, the, the idea is quite simple, is to continue the work of assassinated under threat to jail reporters and to make sure people get access to critical information. Most of the time, journalists get killed because of the stories they just published or they are about to publish, whether it's about corruption, human rights violation, environmental crimes. So the idea is to make sure that uh, even if you kill the messenger, you will never kill the message. It doesn't make sense to kill reporters if you know that there are 50 other reporters ready to carry on this work. So I've been a journalist for the past 25 years now in investigative reporters. I've been traveling around the world and I've been uh, investigating some stories where local journalists were, for the very kind, same kind of stories, were arrested or might be killed. And so I thought at some point we should really create an international task force of investigative reporters ready to continue the work of uh, others. Yeah, it's kind of unbelievable it didn't exist before. And I read also that the idea was sort of sparked by events that happened here in France. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, so I've been a journalist for, for a very long time, but um, what happened in uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, in January 2015 uh, changed a lot of things in, in, um, in, uh, in, in my vision of what we can do as a journalist. So I was working at, at Pomialin. I arrived after the killing happened. I arrived after the terrorists escaped the building. But, uh, but clearly, uh, I was with uh, all the people on the scene of uh, what happened in Charlie Hebdo newsroom and uh, trying to help people. And, and clearly, that event was very traumatizing. And uh, by seeing some colleagues and people being killed uh, in the middle of my town in Paris uh, was uh, uh, traumatizing uh, uh, first um, at the beginning. But then I, I start thinking, okay, what I can do as a journalist to uh, continue the work of um, journalists being killed. And, um, and so I think that as well that most of the time, um, the killer, they don't, too care, they don't care too much about the statement, but they do care much more about having their own crimes exposed everywhere. So if we do work together in a collaborative way, if we are coordinating a large effort, if we are publishing the very same stories they wanted to silence, so maybe we can dissuade them and to, to, to kill some journalists uh, later on. And then you formally launched the organization in 2017. That was the year that Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia was murdered in a car bombing. Can you talk about how you were able to pursue her work? Yeah, so Daphne was killed in 2017. Uh, we, we team up with 45 reporters, 18 news organizations, with The Guardian in the UK, with The New York Times in the US, with Le Monde in France, and many others with one objective. Uh, uh, first, identifying the killer behind the killing, and but also uh, continuing the work of Daphne. So, so we team up to investigate in this country that is part of the uh, EU with a very high level of corruption, of high level of money laundering. And, uh, and so we start the Daphne project. And that Daphne project, uh, the publication of all of that created a lot of impact because um, all partners uh, were able to identify people involved in the, in the killing at a very high level within the government, were able to continue the work of, uh, of Daphne and to show how this uh, corruption was uh, in, the, in the middle of the, all the authorities in Malta. And three people have been convicted for her murder, but not those actually believed to be the masterminds behind it. Do you have hope that they will face justice? Yeah, so two people have already been sentenced for 40 years in jail. Uh, they were pleading guilty, but they are the people who were uh, uh, putting the bombs under the seat of Daphne. But of course, there is a lot that need to be done. Uh, it's not finished yet. A lot of justice have to be, have to be made. There is uh, people who were... Um, uh, financing the crime, people who were facilitating the ex execution of the crime, people who were covering up the investigation into the crime as well. So it's uh, just the beginning. 
And you also work to deter crimes against journalists through what you call the Safe Box yeah. Network. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, the Safe Box Network is the other idea of forbidden stories, is uh, to offer a way for journalists at risk all over the world to secure their ongoing investigation and to let the, the public know about that. That if you receive a threat from a, a, a Mexican uh, corrupted ministers, you can tell us that with forbidden stories. And you can tell the world that, that you are not anymore alone. And that if something happened to you, we will be able to continue the work. This is precisely what we are doing after the killing of Rafael Moreno, a, a Colombian journalist who have been killed uh, 12 days ago in, in the north of Colombia, in the state of Cordoba. And uh, we were in touch with Rafael over the past weeks. Our team was even communicating with him even the, the, in the two days before the killing. And Rafael was sharing with us a lot of his investigation, a lot of what he was working on in case something happened because he knew that the threats against him was extremely high. So Rafael was killed. So we weren't there. And we immediately teamed up with many Colombian journalists, but also journalists from South America and international partners to continue his work. So the Safe Box Network is, very, is a very clear idea where you let the public know that you are not anymore alone. You can share uh, with us what you are doing, and if something happens, we will continue that. The journalists in their, your network, though, who pursue these stories, I mean, one would imagine that they then become a target. Do they feel that they're risking their lives? Actually, the collaboration is bringing a lot of protection. This is, this is how we continue the work of assassinity reporters. So by not only collaborating with local journalists, but with international partners as well. So every time we are starting a project of Forbidden Stories is a very risky investigation. The killer most of the time is still free since we are, in the, uh, we are today the, on the day of the end of Infinity Day. Uh, in 80% of the crimes committed against journalists, the killer is still free, the killing remain unsolved. So when we start a project like that, the killer is still free. So it's very dangerous. So this is why we have to team up with a lot of reporters and to divide the work and to make sure we can investigate the crime, but uh, to continue the work as well of the reporter. Yeah, there's power in, in that network yeah. and the numbers. The two journalists were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Do you think that we're maybe in a moment where there is some growing recognition, uh, recognition of the value of press freedom? Yes, I think so. In the meantime, I think the Nobel Peace Prize was also um, wanted to send a strong signal to the public opinion that without journalism, without journalists alive, uh, democracies are very at risk. And, and we are in a period of a time where uh, many, many people don't understand too much what is about journalism, what is, what is, a bit, what is the difference between the journalism and editorialism as well. So by, by having that kind of recognition for Maria Ressa and Dimitri Muratov is a very great important signal that we need journalism in our democracy. We need journalism to know about human rights violation, about corruption, about environmental crimes. Many journalists are killed today because they are investigating the pollution of a, a private uh, mining company somewhere. We need to know about that since we, we're talking about climate change. We need to access information. And this is clearly our goal with Forbidden Stories, is to make sure people can get access to critical information. It's such important work, and we're very happy that you're doing it. Uh, Laurent Richard, thank you so much for joining us here on France 24. Uh, that was Laurent Richard, the founder of Forbidden Stories, an organization dedicated to pursuing and publishing the work of reporters who have been silenced.